Hello, Jerry. Hey, Jay. Isn't this a cool place? It's awesome. North here, Berkeley here Hills. We are. We're, we're in a gazebo in a private yard of a beautiful home in North Berkeley. Not mine. Uh, some some very well-to-do person lives here. <laughs> That's gorgeous. And we, we were talking at lunch about how different the 21st century is. And I mean, I really believe this is, you know, new normal, phase change, whole new ball game. And uh, it, it seems to me that some of the things that we're looking at in the 21C project, the 21st century workplace, dovetail so precisely with what, what your relationship economy expeditions are doing, mm -hmm. then we might just you know, talk a spell and see where it takes us. We should drift back and forth. That'd be great. Yeah. That'd yeah. be great. Well, I'll take a first go. And to me, things that make the 21st century so different, at first is the incredible acceleration of time. I mean, you don't have to believe Ray Kurzweil precisely when he says that this century won't have 100 20th century style years, but it'll have 20,000. But even if it's only 1,000, mm -hmm. to me, it's a, a total mind blower. And it, it, things are just getting faster, 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 and there's sort of no end in sight. And when I look at the shift in the economy in the last 20 years, the, the 20th century, we went from corporations whose value is 80% tangible, stuff that's on the balance sheet, stuff you could see and touch and you know, bank accounts and trucks and warehouses, to 80% intangible, social capital, ideas, relationships, know-how, savvy, confidence from investors that you sort of had your act together and you could you know, continue to create value. And then the interconnections, where everything seems to be connected to everything else, leads us to an area of complex adaptive systems. And rather than a gobbledygook that goes around that, because it's a real mind bender, to me it's just that things aren't predictable anymore. That you know, when we were in school, there were 10-year plans, five-year plans, and you were sort of irresponsible if you didn't have a five-year plan. Now you're a fool if you have a five-year plan because man plans, God laughs, you know. So those are the, the things that rattle my cage and say the workplace has got to be a lot different. You have a slightly different lens that you put on it. What's your view? Well, we have to be differently in this world. And it used to be that uh, we could sort of build managerial control systems and go do something in the world, and the rest of the world wasn't wired up to respond or defend or, or interact with it. So whatever a company did, which for efficiency's sake, it did in a very hierarchical, structured way, you know, go back to the railroads and the invention of time zones so that the railroads would work properly, um, worked for a long time. Mm. It was a way of developing really large organizations. It, it's what we knew about scale. And if you go back to Coase and uh, this whole idea of the nature of the firm and why do we have firms, it's because the transaction costs inside the firm were lower than the transaction costs of doing everything out in the open marketplace. So a firm could be very efficient somehow. And we're hitting all sorts of, uh, we're hitting all sorts of boundaries. And then in the same moment, in the same time, all sorts of barriers are falling. So it's this really weird time because we're hitting natural boundaries. The fisheries are pretty depleted. There's, mm. listen to anybody who cares deeply about sustainability or the green movement, and they've been yelling for a long time, but now a lot of people are actually waking up, and corporations are waking up. So if you're a corporation and you're, and you're not talking about sustainability now in the boardroom, you're being irresponsible. Mm. It's pretty interesting. So th those, are the, those are the barriers we're hitting of, of a lot of uh, natural resources in particular. But then there's all these boundaries falling, like the cost of talking to everybody has just fallen to zero. Yeah. yeah. Right? It used to be you had to run a marketing campaign. You had to print up stuff and put it in envelopes and pay postage, or you had to hire a creative studio and make an ad and put it on TV and pay for network airtime. And th the cost of being out there and communicating with people and, and, and listening to them and responding to them has just fallen to near zero. Well, even and that's personally, crazy. I mean, I remember when if you're going to make a long distance phone call, it was like a big deal. Can I really afford to do this? I and used to start my speeches. This is quite a while ago, pre-internet pre speeches. But I would say, 
you know, I call my aunt, who is a retired nun and lives in Jane, Janesville, Wisconsin, and I'll call her and she'll say, hi, Jerry, I'm fine, everybody's fine, talk to you later, bye. <laughs> because in her limbic system back here somewhere, it says any long distance phone call is yeah, insanely meter, expensive meter is running. and we should get off it. And she doesn't know that I hardly ever write letters anymore and I hang out on the phone all the time. And this is pre-Skype days yeah. and it was still pretty cheap to do, right? Yeah. So, so totally. And we have these embedded notions of, of what's, what's dear and what's cheap and those are, mess, are being messed with as well. Well, that, that's the whole, leads into the whole thing about we live in a time of abundance mm -hmm. and we still act like we're in a time of scarcity. And is information, so, and we're, we're either in the information age or in the knowledge economy or something like that, and if you take a scarcity approach to that, you'll start thinking that, well, information is really scarce and dear, and also that old equation, that old bugaboo equation, scarcity equals value, that they taught me in business school, not explicitly, but in so many, so many examples of, in fact, many business plans are an attempt to create scarcity in order to create value. Yeah. And it turns out you got to figure out now how to create value in abundance. And that's just a different equation. It's this is oh, part absolutely. of the 21st century is, is you know, a lot of stuff, maybe not fisheries and fish, but certainly information is simply abundant. And it becomes the thing we exchange in order to build relationships. It doesn't become the valuable asset that you have to hoard and keep secret. Your reputation increases and your trustworthiness and credibility increase by sharing the good info. Mm. So it becomes the conversational tool, a, a, a thing that you trade and use and put out in the world uh, to help people understand things. Where, where people don't think I have a nervous tick. There's we, a fly have, buzzing we have a, right a here. Net, which is you know wanting to join the conversation yeah. real bad. It's yeah. sort of a demonstration that it's all connected <laughs> here we are in nature <laughs> oh heavens well you talk about I, I talk about a, an age of networks an era of networks and you talk about a relationship economy and it occurs to me these are you know sort of they're indeed duels of the linked, same coin linked. or something uh, yeah it amazes me how now we value authenticity and transparency and openness, whereas before, I mean, when I was interested in the advertising business, it was sort of what can, what wool can we pull over these people's eyes? Mm -hmm. And corporations, <laughs> it wasn't firewalls; it was like castle walls. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were they were impregnable, you know. And, and there are still companies with impregnable walls. Just try figuring out what's going to be in the iPhone five. True. Right. And and Apple is a profit making machine. They're totally an engine of, 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 of innovation and creativity and really great design. So I, th I think both of these things move forward together in different ways. I think, I think we get the outside open collaborative thing, which will coexist with, in some cases, closed, protected, secret, proprietary. It, that doesn't necessarily vanish. But the whole environment has changed. The whole environment makes it really easy to suddenly share and, and uh, know what's going on. But, but even Apple, I mean, there are aspects of Apple, like their customer interface, where I can go into the store, and granted, it's a little pompous to say I get to talk with a genius. Uh, and some of the geniuses <laughs> are, aren't, aren't the usual definition, yeah. but they're accessible, and you can get through to them, and you can you know, set an appointment a lot easier than getting to see your doctor, mm -hmm. and get things if fixed. If healthcare were half as good as an Apple store? Oh. Heavens. We'd be doing all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, if you could just replace the motherboard, you know. That, well, also people would be flocking to them just to play around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Folks are coming for entertainment rather than they're ill. But, uh, yeah, yeah, good heavens. Mm. Well, the thing that I'm looking at now a whole lot is sort of the paradigm drag of people acting as if these shifts aren't taking place and playing by old rules. Mm -hmm. So they're still playing the cards close to the chest, uh, issuing instructions, not trusting people to sort of do what's right. And to me, companies that sort of don't get on board the clue train at this point are gonna be out of business. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think we've had an economic downturn at all. I think it's this big change. And I, my guess is that 30% of the public companies, just, they aren't going to make it. They're not going to be around. Well, um, one of the different angles into this into this question you're asking, and there's, there's probably a half dozen very nice different vectors that take us into it, is something I call natural cost. 
Hmm. And uh, it's one of the lessons of Craigslist, for example. Right? So what, what does Craigslist tell us? Craigslist, one of the things Craigslist tells me is that the natural cost of providing classifieds, personals, and a bunch of other capabilities is nada. Right. It costs very little to run. If you're not interested in making a big fancy website with lots of JavaScript and fancy things, and if you're not trying to collect information on everybody, and if you're not trying to do all these other things, and certainly if you're not printing information on dead trees and moving it around, and when I see the yellow pages on my doorstep nowadays, I am angry. I tear it open, plastic goes in the <laughs> trash, the thing goes directly into the recycling yeah, bin, I never yeah. open it, I don't touch it, I'm just angry, right? So, so the marginal cost of doing those businesses appears to be nothing. Guess what? You can look around at an awful lot of businesses in our lives today, and the actual natural cost of doing that business is remarkably lower than the current perceived cost of doing that business. And this can happen for, for industry after industry. So I think that when you're saying these companies are going to go away, you need to find your way around to a new asset, a new way of doing business, a new set of business models around it, or the old thing's just not going to be around. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's funny you're bringing up uh, the example of uh, Craigslist. Back when the PC came out and a whole bunch of us met together in these enclaves, the San Francisco PC users group was where I learned mm -hmm. to use the stuff I bought. And uh, I was a member, member of the Washington Apple Pie. Th this was, I mean, looking back, some of the talk was very naive, but you, you need a toehold. You need to be able to get your start and I remember Craig Newmark was a regular at our meetings. Mm -hmm. And indeed, don't have to be too tech because he didn't know squat. None of us knew squat. And yet this thing springs out of his head and bingo, wipes right. out newspapers. Right. Uh, amazing transformation.